This is the Life Stances Podcast, and I'm your host, Lori Beeman. In this podcast, we're exploring life stances in a world of religious change. Life stances are what we think about the world, how we live and act within it, and how we relate to other people, other animals, and the environment. With an increasing number of people identifying as non-religious, this podcast explores how religious change impacts society. In the coming months, we'll look at weddings, funerals, palliative care, charitable giving and volunteering, forest burials, and other topics related to the changing religious landscape. I hope you'll join us. Paradoxically, death's an experience we as humans will all share, and yet it's one that is also deeply individual. How we deal with the process of dying, death itself, burial, grieving, and beliefs about the afterlife is often scripted by religion. In Western societies, Christianity has played a large role. But the place of Christianity is evolving, and as non-religion and religious diversity increase, space is opening for new ways of understanding issues around death and dying. If it seems like we've spent a lot of time talking about death in this podcast, well, it's because we have. Death is one of the major places where the social change we're interested in, increased non-religion, is most obvious. Whether we think about obituaries, how and whether people talk about death, or, as in past episodes, funeral and burial rituals, Things are changing, and we think this change is worth exploring. How do we talk about death now, and how is this different from the past? Chris Miller, a religious studies scholar and postdoctoral fellow with the Non-Religion in a Complex Future Project, summarizes it this way. It feels like there used to be not necessarily certainty, but a little bit more people were confident in the guideposts that they could go to is my, my ideas about what I, what happens when I die will be informed by this place that I go to every week and the, the rituals about what my family should do with me once I die will be informed by this kind of standard, same ritual that they've gone to for, for the course of their lives that, that I attended um, when I, you know, throughout the course of my life. So now I think with the decline of religion, People are kind of discovering that in this vacuum, they, they have a lot of space to be a lot more self-conscious and reflect, or maybe conscientious is the better word about like, what do I want to do? And, and what do I think is going to happen? And if I really kind of deeply reflect on it. So I think it's um, religious people and non-religious people find are just having a period of kind of self-reflection and exploration to approach death in new ways. As Chris explains, this transformation affects not only non-religious people, but religious people too. We have people who are religious, who identify as religious, who attend services regularly and and believe in, um, in this case, you know, Christian beliefs. But when it comes to death and when it comes to rituals, even they kind of see, you know, they'll they'll talk about like, well, I don't want my, my funeral to take place in a church. And even those are kind of looked down upon as, you know, sort of stodgy, boredom and stale. And these are people who attend church. And so that that's why I kind of say that it, it's not just the non-religious who are having this like, well, what do I want for it to be personal? The, the people who are religious are kind of thinking about like, well, yes, these are these are my beliefs and these are my outlooks. And these are the practices that I do for something, baptism, marriage, things like that. But, you know, for, for death, maybe I'm going to think about how I want to do things differently. Crystal Manning, a sociologist and professor at Sacred Heart University in Connecticut, also talks about changing Christian approaches to traditional beliefs. Well, I mean, one example might be the survey research that shows that fewer Christians believe that heaven is located in the sky would be a kind of trivial illustration of that. Um, But another might be that, um, that a growing number of Religious individuals have doubts about the traditional teachings of their church about what will happen to my soul when I die. Yes, I might go to sleep, but will I even be be aware of that? I went to a funeral recently for the wife of an individual who is a believing Catholic, and many of the people in attendance at the Mass 
were other believing Catholics. And we had a conversation about the mass afterward. And several of the believing Catholics expressed the opinion that they were offended by the priest's statements about how uh, the woman who had died at only age 50 from cancer was now in a better place and we should all be happy about this. These changes in the way people talk about life and death are reflected in a number of places, including obituaries. If you think about it, obituaries do more than just announce someone's death. They give us a window into people's lives, including what and who matter to them. That's why so many people read them. Obituaries offer important clues about how we tell stories about life and death. The Non-Religion in a Complex Future Project has done research that examines 3,000 obituaries over 120 years in six newspapers across Canada. As Chris Miller explains, one of the biggest shifts is the growing detail of obituaries. In the early 1900s, you get these obituaries that are like four or five lines. This person died. They died here. You can come and see the body. Then, you know, in, in, the, in the mid-20th century, they start to get a little bit longer. This was a father to someone. This was a, a wife to someone. And maybe we even get a little bit more details. of They, they worked at the post office. They worked at BMO, something like that. We had, but, you know, still... 20 lines. And, and in the last 30 years, we've just seen an absolute explosion. The, the mean length of obituaries is now something like 30 lines. An obituary that's like 100 lines or more is is not all that uncommon. And so along with that, the, the next biggest change is, is detail because there's people are writing a lot more and you need to fill that space up with something. And so the details are things like their family. Somebody goes from being a father to being a loving father to being a man who loved to spend the weekends going out fishing with his kid. You know, somebody somebody goes from working at the post office to, you know, bring a smile to, to all of his coworkers' faces as he approached every new project and, and, and tackled every challenge, things like that. So we just get all of these really rich life narratives of people that have gone through these short little texts of, who was this person? One area we see obituaries becoming more detailed is in the relationships that are mentioned. Yeah, well, I talked about family as the kind of big one. People who had a partner are generally going to mention that. Teens get mentioned. That's also pretty typical. But I think you can almost think about the concentric circles out from someone's life. That's what's grown. It's like grandchildren get mentioned, uh, nieces and nephews get mentioned, uh, aunts and uncles, things who we think of, you know, they're, they're still family, but they're not quite that imme immediate uh, nuclear family. Those people start to get mentioned as this is the, the broader community that a person was connected to. Another kind of relationship that, that comes up a lot is people having friends. I think in, in older obituaries, it's, it's, it's really just about the family. That's the strong unit. And that was where, you know, you, you invested your relationships, at least not that that's how people live their life, but that's what's preserved in these texts. But now it'll talk about somebody's golf buddies or or this couple used to go on vacations with this other couple together. And and so, uh, or, you know, obituaries of a 90-year-old man will still talk about their, their friends from college that they still met up with once a year. And so those friendships really seem to be a lot more impactful and a lot more everlasting. And then one that I... Um, I'm always thrilled when I see is is animals are are making a big big um, I guess push or surge in obituaries. It's that they're listed right alongside um, the family. See, so, you know, th this was his wife. Um, this this was his kid. These were his grandkids. And yet, yes, all those people made him happy. But like here was his furry buddy that he took for walks every day. Um, and and animals, I think, are really starting to to take a, a bigger place in terms of the. The, the lives that people lead, the social relationships that people form, and, and what they want to be remembered for, and, and who they think will remember them after they've died. Surprisingly, though, religion plays a smaller role than we might imagine. Uh, this is something that was surprising. Less than 7% of obituaries will, will talk about that person's religious affiliation. A lot of the obituaries that do talk about the person's affiliation, they were a priest. They sang in the choir. So again, is that their profession that they're talking about? Was that their hobby that they were talking about? There are some obituaries that say he was a man of faith. 
and spiritual her spirituality was very important to her. So those come up, but it, it it just wasn't quite as common as we thought we would find. Even that standard thing that we think of obituaries of rest and peace didn't come up all that often. I expected to find Bible verses in in half of the obituaries, especially in early years. And and those things are only in two or or five percent of all obituaries. And in the last uh, couple of weeks, I've been um, looking at some uh, obituaries from an Argentinian newspaper, and every single obituary has a cross at the top or a QEPD, which I'm not even going to try to say it in Spanish, but is basically like rest in peace. So we, in some contexts, obituaries are generally religious, but in, in Canada, we just we didn't find that was the case. In terms of what's happened recently, that means that there recently that there has been a little bit of an uptick in like the number of religious references. Uh, people talking about this person who died is now cradled in the Lord's arms and taken to heaven. So there, there's a little bit of uptick in the language like that, rather than this being some kind of resurgence of religion that is showing up. I think it's just a reflection of obituaries getting longer getting more detailed in general, just like we nowadays see more mentions of somebody hitting a hole in one, just like that's gone up. It doesn't mean that Canada's full of better golfers than we had 50, 100 years ago. It means that the people for golf is important. They're going to talk about that. The people for religion is important. They're going to talk about that. As we've explored how understandings of death and dying are changing, we thought it might also be interesting to look at the places that people talk about death. That too is changing. One space for discussions about death that's been intentionally created is the death cafe. Now what, you might ask, are death cafes? They're informal meetings of small groups of people who come together to talk explicitly and intentionally about death. Martina Steiger has hosted death cafes in southern Ontario for the past nine years. We asked her to describe for us what it feels like to be at a death cafe. So what happens is you enter the room and you see other people mingling about, getting their tea, their coffee, their water, their snacks, and finding a seat in a big circle that we have arranged with little side tables. We have a, you could put you on your plate with your goodies and your drinks. And then at one o'clock, that's our starting time. Um, I will ask people to make sure they have taken their seat, have their refreshments by their side. And I start. And I start with a very brief breath meditation just to bring us all into the same space, same place just for about a minute or so. Then I will guide you through the touchstones for the event. And the touchstones are, uh, it's a concept developed by Parker Palmer, but that I use, which are the guiding principles for our time together. And they, some of them include that we are here to listen to one another and learn from one another with an open heart and an open mind. We go through confidentiality, so there's a list of them. And then I usually present a little quotation, short excerpt about something to relate it to the topic, just as a way to get us into that whole space. And perhaps as a little bit of food for thought, if somebody wants to comment or reflect on that. And then I also do a little short recap, basically, of what I gave you earlier about what is Death Cafe, what is it, who is it for, what is its mission. And then it's up to the participants to, to introduce themselves. And so I facilitate then the conversation simply by watching who wants to participate, that the people who are not as vocal have also have a chance to, to speak. And I do my best to interweave some of the topics that were mentioned. So we might be able to address all of them in the two hours we have together. And then at the end, we do a brief wrap up, ask if there's anything they want to share as a final thought 
and we announce the next date and that's it. And people in between people can get up, use the washroom, fill up their refreshments. It's pretty, pretty uh, laid back in that regard. So who attends a deaf cafe? It turns out a wide range of people. In part, it depends on the time of day. Retired and older people are more likely to attend during daytime cafes, younger and working people in the evenings. People who attend include those who have a direct relationship with death in their work lives, like palliative caregivers or funeral directors, but also people who just want a safe space to talk about death and dying. What do they talk about? I mean, I'm, I'm not joking, joking when I say almost anything. Uh, from, from very concrete question to what choices do I have to get, how can I get buried? When I die, what happens? What choices do I have to advanced care planning, to wills, to living wills, to how do I have a conversation with my husband or my spouse or my children because they don't really want to talk about, they always say, oh, mom, you're not, you're still so young or difficulties in dealing even with an illness a significant illness between partners or between parents and children of having different points of view of what treatment would be appropriate and how to maneuver that in a in in some way so people are asking those questions questions such as we which i think we had a couple of months ago letting go which people talk about at the end of life, right? It's a big letting go. And people are bringing up, but I have a hard time letting go right now. So how can I even face letting go of something more, much more significant if I have a hard time letting go of a t-shirt, let's say. People have come because they're struggling dealing with an aging parent that they had to admit to a long-term care home um, but the other parent is still at home and they're feeling caught in some of the dynamics or the guilt. We talk a lot about guilt in various scenarios. The fear of death and dying, lots of fears and anxieties. And then others participate because they're needing some help just talking while they are facing the the dying process or long-term illness process, chronic illness process of a loved one, and they need to be able to speak freely about how they feel, including their fears, their resentment sometimes as a caregiver, without feeling judged. And I make sure that is my job as I see it, and that's part of my touchstones, that we do create a safe space that is judgment-free. Of course, where someone is in the life course impacts how they think about death. For all of us, our life experiences shape how we understand death and dying. Crystal Manning has interviewed elderly people about their thoughts on death. Young people in general don't spend as much time thinking about death as older people, and that's natural. Presuming that you're healthy and that you aren't living with a parent who has a terminal illness, um, or have a sibling who is struggling with that, you know, most young people are focusing on their future, right? But as we get older, we have experiences with getting sick ourselves and getting injured and taking a longer time with, to recover. We have experiences with people that we went to high school with or college or an ex-boyfriend seeing on Facebook that they suddenly died. We have experiences as we get older of uh, thinking about the fact that I'm not going to be here maybe 20 years from now or hopefully 30 years from 40 years from now, but it becomes more real is my point. Um, and one of the, another interesting illustration of that was when I was doing my research with elderly non-religious people mostly in institutional settings, but some at home. And I would walk around in the nursing home and I'd have, I would have group conversations with people and I would have individual interviews with people. And 
often when I began the research, I was a little bit uncomfortable about asking questions of someone who is 89 years old. So what do you think about dying? You know, I didn't phrase it like that, but my point is, you know, asking the question when I began the project felt awkward, right? And I overcame the awkwardness pretty quickly because people would sense that I would that I was feeling awkward and they would say things like, don't worry, I'm 89 years old. I spend a lot of time thinking about death, right? So it's it's more of a real possibility. And so we spend more time thinking about it. When we spend more time thinking about it, we reflect on uh, what did I learn about this as a child? How do I really think about it? So of course, our thoughts on the matter are, are going to evolve. One thing that we think is especially interesting is the fact that ideas about the afterlife are changing as more and more people reject traditional religious views of life and death. Crystal Manning's research helps us to understand this. My research, and I, I think that's supported by other research that's available, non-religious individuals tend not to believe in an afterlife in, in the religious sense that, you know, our soul goes to another place to live on there. But for me, the more interesting question was not so much what do they not believe, but what do they believe? How do they imagine things at that stage? What is your, as you call it, imaginary, what is your uh, anticipation of what that is going to be like? And what was really interesting to me was that there is some variation there. So there's diversity. People have different expectations of what is going to happen. And in the article that I published most recently, I talked about three different narrative patterns, one of which was the idea that lights will, you know, it's kind of like the lights are out, you know, my, my brain is dead and then everything goes black and it's over, right? And that's very, very final. Um, but that wasn't the only way that people looked at it. There were other people who thought about it more in terms of a type of continuity, but not the continuity where my soul goes to live in heaven, but rather more of a continuity with nature and the universe. So um, a kind of sense of everything gets recycled, you know? The, uh, phys the physical parts of me are going to feed the soil somehow, and my consciousness is going to somehow merge with with the energy that uh, that forms the universe that we live in, right? So that's the second pattern. And then the third pattern that I observed was what you might call mystery, that people simply acknowledge that we don't know what's going to happen and that they felt okay with that, right? So um, I interviewed close to 100 people all around the country in different settings, and those were the most common narratives that stood out. I don't think they're the only ones. I'm sure there's even more variation out there that, that we uh, still need to learn about. It's not only non-religious people who are rethinking afterlife. You know, for, from an anecdotal personal experience point of view, Whenever I've given a presentation on this most recent research to a mixed audience, the reaction that I always get from people who uh, are religious, so someone, you know, who will say, oh, I'm Catholic, and I actually think of uh, dying as lights out, or, you know, I am Jewish, and I actually think of dying as a mystery. So I don't think that these patterns are necessarily unique to non-religious people, uh, but they are certainly uh, different from uh, believing in a you know traditional soul goes to heaven type of trajectory. These ideas about afterlife are also reflected in obituaries, as we learned from Chris Miller. Yeah, when looking at all the different ideas that people are sharing about what they think might be happening um, after that person has died, of course, the religious ones are quite popular. 
in, in terms of the non-religious ideas, I, I break it down into a couple of different categories. One of them that, that seems really popular is sort of being reunited. It's, it's suggesting in some way that this person is going to be reunited with their family. Remember him with joy, not tears, for he is with his Isabel, which in this case happened to be uh, his, his deceased wife. Now she can join her brothers and sisters once again. And so while I think there's an element here of, you know, in what ways does this kind of resemble Christian ideas about what's happening, I think it's important that these aren't referencing heaven. These aren't referencing, you know, a creator or something transcendent. All that is being revealed is that this person has died and then they will go be reunited with that person. A, a similar sort of idea is, is that somebody goes to a better place. He's no longer with us in this physical realm. His strength and devotion to his friends and family will forever be an inspiration. So we know that he's not in the physical realm, but it kind of suggests that he is still somewhere. Again, where that is, what form that looks like is not quite clear, but but there is a kind of strong idea that they have probably continued on in some form. And, and especially this comes up for people who were suffering, who had, you know, whether, you know, a painful death or a long death specifically from disease, it's often they've now gone to a better place. Um, and, and I think that kind of vagueness highlights the, the fact that people have these less, I don't want to say unclear, but, but not... Um, Whereas traditionally you would have a very clear picture of what heaven or what the afterlife looks like, it's now all we can say for certain is that it's a better place than than where they were. Another way to think about afterlife is how the memory of someone carries on after they die. A person may have died, but their impact will live on. I, I think that a lot of obituaries, even if it's not talking about where the deceased is, it's made very clear that the bereaved, we will remember them. Your laughter will live on forever. This person leads a legacy of love, positivity, resilience. Another person will be forever remembered by those who heard him tell his many stories. His family will continue his legacy by sharing all of these stories. So those are the ones that make it really explicit. Of it was this thing about this person that made them special, that, that made them unique. And the obituary makes it very clear that we are going to remember this, we are going to pass on these stories, and that will be the person's legacy. And so obituaries themselves are this act of creating a legacy, preserving these legacies, and by publishing it in the newspaper, sharing this legacy so that other people kind of have those memories and, and carry them along as well. Whether beliefs about an afterlife are based on religion, a scientific understanding of decomposition and energy, or living on through one's actions during a life course, Death Cafe conversations enable people to explore practical, emotional, and philosophical ideas about death and dying. These kinds of deep conversations on death don't always happen in everyday life. But do we live in a death-averse society? Certainly, if we think about the news every day, it seems that we're actually preoccupied with death. But Martina Steiger has another viewpoint. I grew up in Germany, so I'm quite familiar with that society, and I go back and forth all the time. I lived in France, in England, in Russia, and then I came to Canada, lived in the United States, and I realized attitudes were somewhat similar towards death and dying, and the fact that we are living in a relatively death-phobic society. And so we don't usually, generally, find a receptive atmosphere to talk about what might be going on in our minds, heads, bodies, when we are faced with the fact that other people around us are dying, or we are dying, or a young person, for instance, receives a terminal illness. We face a lot of judgments or discomfort, dis-ease, and which shuts down conversation. The language of obituaries might also be interpreted as reflecting death avoidance. As Chris Miller tells us, there's a shift over time in obituaries from saying someone died to saying they passed away dead or died used to be back in, you know, the, the early 1900s used to be the de facto. It was very matter of fact. This person died. That's what happened. 
and then passed away or they passed and we we regret to announce the passing kind of tickled in here and there and then dead or death has kind of stayed consistent across time right? it's an audio file and i'm tracing with my finger but uh, just kind of a straight line across no change whereas passed away has just absolutely skyrocketed this has become like the nearly de facto way that people are describing what happens at the end of life i don't quite see it as you know passed away has all these complicated connections with passing on to somewhere else continuing on in some form i'm not certain that everyone who's writing passed away believes that that person has passed on to something else somewhere else um but rather that, you know, I, I think it might also, that that's probably there for many people, but I think it's also connected to a bit of un, uneasiness. I uh, was talking about death, which we tend to dance around this kind of taboo topic without kind of confronting it head on. And so for right, even though it, it feels kind of contradictory to, to, to see death as taboo when you're writing an obituary or, or a literal death notice, but I think it is still sometimes hard to, kind of type that out when you're sending it in and so passed away kind of removes a little bit uh, of that sting and, and related to that there's also been just a big growth in like the number of adjectives of, of how somebody passed away or even how they died now people pass away suddenly or they pass away quietly or they pass away peacefully and i i see that as a way of you know wanting to kind of create this image that that this person had a good death don't worry, it, it wasn't painful, it was peaceful. Um, or if they passed away suddenly, it kind of means that they didn't suffer. And so even though we're hearing this devastating news about this person's death, because obituaries are longer, we're using more descriptive language, hearing about how they passed away specifically kind of helps us, eases our mind, comforts us a little bit of, well, I'm glad to hear that they went peacefully. What does this changing language mean? Why do people now pass instead of die? Perhaps it reflects an anxiety about death rather than any kind of literal belief in an afterlife. But maybe the anxiety is not even about death itself, but rather about loss and grieving, about coming to terms with the fact that someone is actually gone. I think the point about grieving is really important because it's really common to hear people talk about how we live in a death averse society or a, or a death denying society. And I think there's some scholars who've started to push back against that because, I mean, at the height of COVID, you would see the front page of the newspaper would be saying, here's the death toll, or you turn on the news, or you watch, you listen to true crime podcasts and documentaries. And so, like, we're not death denying, but we are like, intimate death uh denying or averse and so i think when it is something that we are personally grieving that's when it becomes a little bit harder to approach so we want to be a little bit more sensitive to it because it's it's direct it's personal why talk about death in some ways it actually gives us an opportunity to think about life and how to live it fully and meaningfully here's crystal manning you know just a for instance you know, I'm getting to the age where I could retire, but, you know, I don't have to. Um, you know, I don't, I'm an academic. I don't lift boxes into a truck. You know, I could conceivably do this for another 20 years if I wanted to, right? Um, and so lately I've been asking myself, um, how much longer do I want to do what I do, right? And uh, the big elephant in the room is, you know, the fact that our plumber died last Friday and he was my age and, you know, stuff like that just happens. And, and it just, it reminds you that you don't have forever. And I, I, I guess where I'm going with this is that my sense is that when we do not believe in an afterlife, the traditional, my soul will go to live somewhere afterlife or my soul will reincarnate to be a great warrior princess next time around or something. Uh, when we don't believe in that, then this life is all we've got, right? And it kind of focuses my attention on what do I want to do with the time that I have left? Uh, how do I want to use it in a way that is productive and joyful and will have an impact that matters to me? So in that light, 
you know, there, there, there's this perception that the belief in the afterlife is comforting and it's what gives life meaning. As Crystal Manning notes, some people say things like, Oh, if I didn't believe in the next world, then life would be meaningless. And okay, great. But I don't share that perception. I, I don't think that life has to be meaningless. I think it's actually quite the contrary. And for non-religious people, like the people that I interviewed, I asked them a lot about, I, I mean, I, I asked them several questions about how they thought about the time that they had left. And they were very much focused on how can I, even when they were disabled, still do things in this world that will be positive, right? So contribute towards some kind of social movement or um, help my grandchild or, or find joy with the people that I care about, right? So the acceptance, and because they were non-religious, they had to grapple with this fact, right? that they would not go to another place, right? Uh, because they were non-religious, they had to deal with those feelings and somehow move through them. And that helped many of them have an outlook of using this life in the best way possible. So I, I sort of see that as a sort of po positive outcome of, of not believing in the afterlife narrative. Um, that runs contrary to this idea that the afterlife narrative is, is comforting and that our lives will be better with it than without it. Likewise, for Martina Steiger, we should not be afraid to talk about death. In her view, talking about death can help us to focus on how we want to live. I think the first thing that comes to mind is what all my participants pretty much share most of the time. And that is when they say, oh, I'm so looking forward to Death Cafe this afternoon and all their friends' jaws drop and they say, harder? What do you mean looking forward to Death Cafe? What the heck is Death Cafe? And isn't that morbid? And the same with when I talk with people, even some of my acquaintances and even some of my friends and I mentioned something and I see their faces becoming a little bit glazed over and waiting for me to take a breath so they can say, now let's go to something more uh, happier to talk about, right? It's most of the time with most people, there is a discomfort and a lot of that discomfort has to do with ourselves, right? With our unresolved issues. So for me, um, a society that would not be death phobic would welcome those conversations, would not go into judgment mode right away of, oh, this is morbid or that's unhappy or let's let's go to something that's more joyful. And, and yet, if you ever participated in any, whether it's my in-person or online death cafe, we have a ton of laughs. So there is a lot of joy. There's a lot of uh, laughter. Um, because we're dealing with the cycle of life, right? The only guarantee we have when we are born is that we're born to die. That's the only guarantee. But we don't like uncertainty. So I think a non-death phobic, a, a society that would welcome those conversations would be um, more real about the uncertainties of life and not looking for necessarily that life needs to be just and fair and that we can postpone death at infinitum at any cost. I think it would also help us uh, in thinking differently about our health care and preventative care and what quality of life really means and not leave it right to the very end of life, but as the mission of Death Cafe states, how does our thinking about all of that inform us so we can live more fully today? An aspect of the social revolution caused by the changing religious landscape is the way we think about death, dying, and afterlife, and, as a consequence, 
life and its meaning. The stories we tell about our own lives and those we care about are impacted in this process, as well as how we think about the world around us. Part of this social change is the new ways of understanding death, dying, afterlife, grieving, and ritual. These are less bound by social convention than they have been in the past. Some of those social conventions were informed by religion. With the increase in non-religion, we see emerging and complex ways to think about what happens when we die. We also see changes in obituaries, which now tell life stories in greater detail and focus on what mattered to people during their lives. Relationships are at the core of these stories. There are new places like death cafes where people can talk frankly about death, including exploring their fears, their doubts, and their worries. Of course, as we've discussed in previous episodes, dramatic social change can also be disorienting for some people. Death is already filled with uncertainty, so the changes we've identified can be especially anxiety-provoking. Yet, as we've discussed in this episode, we can also see this change as an opportunity to think about how we want to live a full and meaningful life. We hope you'll join us in the next episode as we continue to explore the impact of non-religion. 